Okay, welcome to another uh, wild networking video. We're going to be continuing to read the BGP RFC. Um, this video won't be quite as long as the other one. Um, that was like over two hours, um, but uh, a good 30 minutes uh, should be plenty. So I uh, don't remember where I left off in the last um, video, so I'm going to pull up the description section. So the last video, unfortunately, it's oh. yeah. So here's the video I did last. Oh, it was three hours. <laughs> um, but uh, this is where I left off. So this is where I'm going to start. Okay. And I'll get my lab up again last video where he started looking at some of the actual header formats or the message formats. So we looked at the, yeah, we started looking at the message formats. So we looked at the header, which is a, a message format. Um, we're going to be looking at the open uh, message format as well, but just a quick review from the header. Um, you've got the marker, the length, and the type, and technically you don't really have a BGP header because there's no such thing really as a BGP uh, packet. Um, what you have is, is TCP data, and in that data you have this marker of 16 uh, ones, ones that say, hey, this is going to be a BGP message uh, of length this, and uh, the type of this message, um, it's going to correspond to these uh, four codes here. Um, and then there's an additional type, uh, a uh, refresh, raw refresh. So we'll be going through each of these types, um, starting with the open message format. After a TCP connection is established, the first message sent by each side is an open message. If the open message is acceptable, a keep alive message confirming the open is sent back. In addition to the following fixed size BGP header, the open message contains the following fields. So I'm going to pull up my lab and we'll take a look at these fields in uh, Wireshark as, as, <clears throat> as I go through. So here's the lab topology I've been using for this series. Um, really cool thing, I, I switched my lab over to running uh, KVM virtualization on just a uh, version uh, 18.04 uh, image of Ubuntu server and it, it just runs beautifully now it, before like it would take like a half an hour for it to boot up um, you know this many routers um, but now it takes less than five minutes it's really a trivial thing to just uh, boot up a router now it used to be a, a big thing that I would actually have a cron job up to, to plan for to have it happen automatically for me but now I just look at how fast it's going. But I'll continue to read about the versions while this is moving on. Or about the open message uh, format, the first uh, part being the version. This one octet unsigned integer indicates the protocol version number of the message. The current BGP version number is four the autonomous system this 18 octet oh and and before i forget here i can just uh start uh the capture here and we'll see that as these come up uh because i've got the configuration saved on there so we'll see these messages start to come in as we're waiting for it to come up okay so the my autonomous system this two octet Unsigned integer indicates the autonomous system number of the sender. 
hold time. This two octet unsigned integer indicates the number of seconds the sender proposes for the value of the hold timer. Upon receipt of an open message, a BGP speaker must calculate the value of the hold timer by using the smaller of its configured hold time and hold time received in the open message. The hold time must be either zero or at least three seconds. You can't have a one or a two second or a millisecond uh, hold time. An implementation may reject connections on the basis of the hold time. The calculated value indicates the maximum number of seconds that may elapse between the receipt of successive keep alive and or update messages from the sender. So that's kind of an interesting thing. You can't set it to one or two seconds. You have to set it to a unit of seconds. Um, and whatever you set it to, if you receive a smaller value in an open message format, that's the whole time that gets used. I think that's what that said. Yeah. Yeah. So let's um, let's take a look at that in the lab. Um, what we're going to do is set up a neighborship, and we're going to have two different hold times. And we'll see before the neighborship has formed um, what the hold time is. Um, and then we'll see if it changes after that uh, open message has received, has been received. So maybe my configuration did not persist. Although the login prompt is still there. Or maybe it's left over. I was doing something. I had it shut down or something. Oh, oh no, no, it's okay. It was just behind the curve a little bit. Oh, the show uh, FPC zero. This probably, yeah, this is still, uh, looks like it's still working on. Uh, yeah, so it went from absent to testing. Yeah, we're only getting the, these messages from one side. There we go. Now we've got everything. So. Let's take a look at these message formats. So we've got um, in a BGP open message, which is uh, type uh, two. So let's see if we can filter BGP uh, open. Oh, uh, I guess we need to do more than that. Um, uh, so let's this version. Okay, so here's our open messages. So now here's the uh, header that's a part of all BGP messages, which remember are not actually BGP messages, they're just uh, part of the TCP payload. Um, we can see the TCP payload size is the same as the message size. Here's the marker so that we can differentiate between um, just a regular TCP payload and a TCP payload that is the BGP message. Um, or, well, actually, we, we wouldn't be differentiating between that. We'd be, because the whole TCP payload is the order gateway protocol message. Uh, it's not like you can have multiple messages in the payload, I think. Maybe you can. But, um, we need to know um, that the payload is a BGP message because you can have anything be a part of your TCP payload. You can have, you know, this is how information is exchanged on the internet is in these payloads. So it can be anything. You need to give it a marker here so that it knows that it's BGP. We've got the length. We've got uh, our open message, type 1. We've got uh, version four, my autonomous system, hold time, BGP identifier. Uh, we've got optional 
space for, for optional parameters. Uh, and uh, oh, so, so this is the length of our optional parameters. Um, and then here's, here's our actual optimal optional parameters. So it's got to tell it how many uh, bits of optional parameters it will receive. And it preserves uh, four octets. Uh, of information in order to do that, 16 bits. Oh, oh sorry, 32 bits. Um, oh, oh, sorry, actually, um, one octet. It preserves one octet of information. Yeah, and we can see that because this is 4.4.4.4 uh, mapping to uh, hexadecimal. So, yeah, each of those octets here. Uh, gets two numbers here, so this length only has one uh, pair of numbers here, so it only gets one octet. Um, so that's uh, eight bits of information for the length. You, you've got a hard limit on, on the maximum si size uh, you can have because you, you've only got these two bits to uh, to uh, so show that so so your maximum number of um, uh, optional parameters. I think I think maybe. Well, let's we'll get we'll get to that. We'll learn about that. We're not done reading everything yet. So, um, um, oh, but I can see optional parameters length. This one octet unsigned. Integer indicates the total length of the optional parameters field in octets. If the value of this field is zero, no optional parameters are present. So yeah, you've got a hard limit on how many uh, options you can give because you've only got one octet to specify that. So before I go back into the lab and do this experiment with the whole timer, I'm just going to finish reading this section of the RFC. The next message format or, sorry, the next field in the open message format for BGP that we can see here um, after uh, version AS and hold time is the BGP identifier. This four octet unsigned identifier indicates the BGP identifier of the sender. A given BGP speaker sets the value of its BGP identifier to an IP address that is assigned to the BGP speaker. The value of the BGP identifier is determined upon startup and is the same for every local interface and BGP peer. Optional parameters length. Okay, so we read that already. Moving down to optional parameters. This field contains a list of optional parameters in which each perimeter is encoded as a parameter type, parameter length, parameter value, triplet. Ah, so these are these are t type, length, value, TLV. That's something that uh, shows up a lot in uh, the the actual bits on the wire are these TLV type length value indicators. So I'm pretty sure there's one as a part of To. I thought like type TLV like you would see TLV listed somewhere else in the, the data here but uh, apparently I was wrong about that I don't see it anywhere okay but parameter type is a one octet field that on ambiguously identifies individual parameters. 
Parameter length is a one octet field that contains the length of the parameter value field in octets. Parameter value is a variable length field that is interpreted according to the value of the parameter type field. Oh, I don't see, I don't see the value. Is this the value? I see type and length, but I don't see value. Maybe they just fill in what the value is. The value is capability. I think that's what they're doing. So, so this is a value here, a value field, but it's it's not um, it's not listed that way. It's listed as capability. Okay, and one of my favorite things about Wireshark, um, which unfortunately is kind of a neglected feature, is that you can right click on anything in Wireshark and go to Wikipedia protocol page. Now you can see that the Wireshark Wikipedia is maintained by the community. I actually have some uh, writing on there, but that's, that's like if anyone's watching this and, and, and they've learned about this for the first time, especially if you're an expert, you have your CCIE already or something, and you really know these, these protocols well, even if you just passed your, your CCMP, even your CCNA, or um, you're preparing to take your CCNA for the first time and you, you think, hey, you know, I've got this down, I'm going to pass, there's nothing that's going to uh, come and um, prevent me from passing because I know the material so well. Uh, click yes to go to the, Wiki, the page, and once you're there, um, here you go, create new empty page and you make your own um, uh, documentation for BGP and you're the guy who wrote the documentation for BGP on, on Wireshark and you can put that on a resume, uh, what have you. And uh, that's something I recommend everyone uh, start doing more of who actually uses uh, Wireshark, even just in the lab, but especially professionally, um, contribute to the Wireshark Wikipedia page. Now you will have to um, be given uh, permissions, but it, it tells you how to do that here. If you are a member of the editor group, you can edit this wiki, and then you just need to send an email to the guy who made this. But I have done that, so I am a member of the editor group, so I can, um, I can, uh, edits and this should if I if I do a Wikipedia protocol page here yeah so there is some uh, documentation here oh I see okay so it looks like one of the reasons why this is uh, in such poor uh, repairs because they actually moved where they wanted to go But they didn't, well, maybe that's what the, the current update, because I've been neglecting some updates. But as of this version that I'm using, which is uh, 3.2.4, this help menu is still linked. This Wikipedia protocol page option in the dialog box is still linked to the old place the old Wiki, Wikipedia page. The new one is going to be a uh, part of a GitLab repository. And I know how to contribute to that, um, so I might want to... Yeah, it looks like you have to be in the editor's group for this as well. Um, let's just take a quick look at the repository to see if there's anything for BGP. Oh, 
so this is the this might be the wrong repository because it looks like it's the repository for the code of Wireshark itself. I want the documentation. So, yeah. So maybe if I go to Wireshark Foundation. Ah, here we go. So yeah, there's a, a separate repository for the the wiki. Uh, this is very confusing. I think this is it, actually. Okay, so this looks like it's how I view the pages. Huh. Yeah, this is just absolutely frustrating. So it looks like even though it's it's been moved and, and is on a new platform, it's still in a pretty sad and sorry state. So if you want instant cred and something to put it on your resume, contribute to that. That's an easy way to do it. Okay, the minimum length of the open message is 29 octets, including the message header. Next message is the update message format. All right, so we've got some update messages here. I'm just going to I'm just going to filter for BGP. Um, we can see what kind of message it is up here. So, yep, here's the two updates. Update messages are used to transfer routing information between BGP peers. The information in the update message can be used to construct a graph that describes the relationships of the various autonomous systems. By applying rules to be discussed, routing information loops and some other anomalies may be detected and removed from inter-AS routing. An update message is used to advertise feasible routes that share common path attributes to appear or to withdraw multiple unfeasible routes from service, C3.1. An update message may simultaneously advertise a feasible route and withdraw multiple unfeasible routes from service the update message always includes the fixed size BGP header and also includes the other fields as shown below. Note some of the shown fields may not be present in every update message. Okay. Right. And we saw, um, we saw that, that they are uh, different. So this one has the path attributes field. And it has the network layer reachability information field, as well as the total path attribute length field, but it does not have the withdrawn routes field. Uh, or the withdrawn routes length field, which is described here. This two octets unsigned integer indicates the total length of the withdrawn routes field in octets. Its value allows the length of the network layer reachability information field to be determined as specified below. The value of zero indicates that no routes are being withdrawn from service and that the withdrawn routes field is not present in this update message. Well, that's interesting. I'm surprised it's not. Oh, it is, it is there. It is there and it has a value of zero. So the next um, withdrawn routes um, doesn't appear at all because because this is set to zero. All okay, right. So before we get into to this, which it looks like it's it's uh, a fair bit of depth to it to withdrawn routes, um, let's go back and, and do that experiment where I change I take a look at the whole time. So I'm going to do show BGP summary, uh, and we've got. 
Oh, um, so I'll open up the other side as well. Yep, part of four. There we go. Okay, so... Uh, so we, ha we have a neighbor that's up. So now we've got a, a hold time of 90. Um, so let's change the hold time on uh, one side and we'll change it down to uh, how about 89. And then we'll see, well actually, instead of that, um, let's first of all hard code a new hold time. Well, let's hard code the, the hold time to uh, 90. So we'll just make sure that um, there, there's no uh, that, that everything is, is clear and transparent, and it actually uh, has that. Even though that's the default, um, just so it's more clear that it is set to 90 on one side, but it has a value that is not 90 because it receives a um, an open message with a value lower than 90. Okay, but in order for it to receive an open message, I'm going to need to bounce the port. Um, but let's uh, go ahead and... Uh, uh, so this is the one we're going to be watching uh, change its value. So I will be running this command again. Um, that is unexpected. Oh, I, okay, I had the wrong. Okay, so now we, we can see we've got a whole time of, of 90, and that is, uh, we just saw, uh, hard-coded into the config, but even though it's hard-coded into the config, if I change this side to 89 and then bounce that uh, connection, this side will change to 89 as well because the value in the open message received uh, from this side is is a, a lower value. Before I hit commit, I'll bring Wireshark up, and uh, and we'll see we'll see what happens when I just hit commit. Um, I don't think it, maybe there'll be an update. Oh, there's a notification. Oh, okay. So it looks like doing that bounced my neighborship. Um, so hopefully it starts. Up. Aha! So here's the open message. Um, we can see the whole time of 89 was sent in the open message. It looks like changing that uh, whole timer bounced to the connection. That's good to know. Um, but uh, our whole time is still at 90 on this side, which is not what I was expecting at all. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's not at all what I was expecting. Because I thought that... Oh! So it looks like we've got an extra value here. We've got active hold time. So if I were to stop this and scroll up, you didn't have that value uh, before. So that's kind of nice. I, I actually like that. It tells you what the hold time is configured as, because we, we saw that in the description. It is configured as 90. But in addition, it will tell you when it is receiving a open message that modifies it because it has a lower value. Uh, that is the active hold time. The active hold time is 89. And we can see if I change it to, um, to, to be uh, 
91, a greater value, that will go away. And that's and now that'll that'll bounce the connection. There's our notification. I, I reset the BGP connection in doing that, but we'll get our open message back. We'll see a value of 91 for the whole time. There it is. But uh, we've got our active whole time at 90 now, matching our configured whole time, <laughs> and that's because. This is a, a lower value, um, so, so we still have this active hold time modifier there because it looks like the value was set through the actual open message because this has a lower value than that and not the configuration. If I were to set the hold time to 90, um, they would have the same uh, hold time value. And you, they would no longer have to learn it from the update message. So there's the notification. Um, so they will not need to have the active hold time listed because it's just the one that's configured. So here's our open message. Um, oh, actually, never mind. Um, I was wrong about that. So when I had the, the connection down, we didn't have a, a active hold time. But uh, anytime it's up, you're going to have an active hold, hold time. Uh, I was thinking that since the active hold time matched the configured hold time, you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have that showing up. But the reason it wasn't showing up before was because the connection wasn't established, so there was no active connection. So this. Um, is the the uh, this will show up even if you have matching hold times on both sides of your neighborship it will just match the value clearly <laughs> but um, it will choose the uh, lowest set uh, hold time is what this value will be this value will will be what you have configured in your configuration but that might not necessarily be what is actually used. For that, you'll need to check the active whole time. Okay, so moving on with the RFC, the next um, section is the withdrawn routes uh, field of the open message format, I think. Now, the update message format. Yeah, so this is the withdrawn routes field of the update message format for the TCP portion of a, for, for, a, for a, a, a TCP BGP payload. <laughs> This is a variable length field that contains a list of IP address prefixes for the routes that are being withdrawn from service. Each IP address prefix is encoded as a two tuple of the form length prefix, whose fields are described below. Length one octet prefix variables. Let's take a look at that. And this is a update message. That one right here. So, length and prefix. Oh, sorry. No, this is this is an update message, but it's an update message for withdrawn routes. So, in order to get that message, we've got to withdraw some routes. So let's do that. have 
The loopback interface, so the route on it will be withdrawn in this update message here. Here it is. So we've got our withdrawn routes field, which contains a, a length and a prefix. Here it is. Length is 32, the size of a IPv4 address. And then here's the prefix that was configured on uh, loopback zero. So one thing that's interesting is there's one octet available for the length. So that's kind of interesting because if you have one octet, oh, there are nine. One octet is a lot. No, no, it's not. One octet is not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so if you have if you have one octet. Um, you're going to have a maximum length of uh, 255 or, or 256, I guess I'm, I think it would be 256 because you could have 0 through 255. So you have, you have a maximum length of uh, 256 uh, characters. Now, now you'll be totally fine if you're using IPv4 because it's 32 characters. In addition, you'll be totally fine if you're using IPv6 as it's 128 characters. But what if you're using something like EVPN where there's 304 characters? That I'm I'm kind of interested to uh, uh, learn whether or not there's perhaps an extension to this field or something like that. Because when I hear about the length of the length fields, <laughs> I immediately imagine a situation where the length field is too small. And I have imagined such situation now. That would be for EVPN routes, which are oftentimes 304 bits in length. The use and the meaning of these fields are as follows. Length. The length field indicates the length in bits of the IP address prefix. A length of zero indicates a prefix that matches all IP addresses with prefix itself of zero octets. Prefix. The prefix field contains an IP address prefix, followed by the minimum number of trailing bits needed to make the end of the field fall on an octet boundary. Note that the value of trailing bits is irrelevant. Total path attribute length. This two octet unsigned integer indicates the total length of the path attributes field in octets. Its value allows the length of the network layer reachability field to be determined as specified below. A value of zero indicates that neither the network layer reachability information field nor the path attribute field is present in this update message. So we'll see a length zero for the total path attribute length in a withdrawn uh, method because yep so because we don't have uh, network layer reachability information in this because all, we're taking information out we're not adding information back in so obviously we won't have uh, information included in there because we're not we're not including information in there <laughs> we're taking information out next section uh, is uh, path attributes. A variable length sequence of path attributes is present in every update message except for an update message that carries only the withdrawn routes. Each path attribute is a triple uh, attribute type, attribute length, attribute value, TLV, type length value of variable length. Attribute type is a two octet field that consists of the attribute flags octet 
followed by the attribute type code octet. So we're going to need to find this, but we'll only find it in, in a BGP message that has uh, path attributes. We don't have that in, in a message that has a total path attribute length of zero, obviously. So we've got to uh, increase that. So if I just roll back my changes and commit, we'll get another update and we will have uh, a value greater than zero in this two octet total path attribute length field. Okay, there's my keep along. And here's my total attribute length field. We've got 21. So here's the path attributes. And within that, we've got the attribute flags and the attribute type codes. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, so here's the flag, and then here's the uh, type code. The high order bit, bit zero, of the attribute flags, um, octet, is the optional bit. It defines whether the attribute is optional if set to one or well known if set to zero. So let's uh, cover up. I'm going to cover up what's on my screen here, um, just, just for my own uh, view. And let's see if we can find, just by looking at the hex, any optional values. I don't see any. It looks like I only see well-known values. So let's, I'm going to take my hand away and see if there's any well-known values. Okay, so it looks like the very first one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Take my hand away and see if there's any optional values. I said that they were all well known and there wasn't going to be any optional because I looked at the hexadecimal and I did not see a, uh, a value with uh, a number greater than um, eight. So if you had eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, or F, uh, beginning uh, uh, in anywhere here, then you would have um, uh, optional attributes. Oh, yeah. So you can see we've only got well-known. We don't have any optional. The second high order bit, bit one of the attribute flags octet is the transitive bit. It defines whether an optional attribute is transitive if set to one or non-transitive if set to zero. For well-known attributes, the transitive bit must be set to one. So we're going to see all of the transitive bits set to one. Oh, and, and you can, you, you, one thing that's really nice is, is you don't have to look down in here and, and you know, do the calculation, oh, it's got to be 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, or F. You can just expand the flag section and then take a look at each uh, bit, um, and then and and then ignore the extra bits down here. And now you can see, uh, yep, there's there's a zero there. You don't have to um, just look at the hex here and, and do the conversions. Here you're you're seeing binary. So if I if I click um, here on the flags, down here we've got a four zero. But here we've got, we've, it looks like we've got eight digits, but down here we've only got two digits. Why is that? It's because here we're looking at the binary, we're looking at every single bit uh, in this field, and here we're looking at uh, an abbreviation of those bits. But, I mean, we're looking at every single bit in the field down there as well, but it's, it's a shorthand. Okay, so the 
origin path attribute is not optional. It is well known. And therefore, it is transitive. It has to be transitive if it is well known. Similar for the AS path attribute, it is well known, which is the alternative to optional, and therefore it is transitive. Next hop is also well known. It's got a zero in the optional bit, so that means it is well known. It means that the bit is not set. When it's a zero, it means that the bit is not set. When it's a one, it means the bit is set. It's switched to on like a light switch. And that has to be true if this bit is switched to off. And that makes it a well-known transitive path attribute, the next hop, just like all the other ones. The final well-known transitive path attribute is local preference. The third high order bit, bit two of the path attributes octet is the partial bit you see right here. It defines whether the information contained in the optional transitive attribute is partial, if set to one, so these are not set to one, or complete if set to zero. These are set to zero. They are complete. And we can see it here. So we've got transitive, well-known, and complete set. Uh, we've also got extended length, but... Oh, so that's going to be discussed next. For well-known attributes and for optional non-transitive attributes, the partial bit must be set to zero. So just like how the transitive must be set to one if it's a well-known path attribute. The partial must be set to zero if it is a well-known path attribute. The fourth high order bit, bit three of the attribute flags octet is the extended length bit. It defines whether the attribute length is one octet if set to zero or two octets if set to one. The lower order four bits of the attribute flags octet are unused. They must be zero when sent and must be ignored when received. The attribute type code octet contains the attribute type code. Currently defined attribute type codes are discussed in section five attribute type code. Oh, here it is. So this is where um, it's, it's determined that these are different types, this type being IGP, or sorry, being origin with a value of IGP, being AS path, next hop, and local preference. And that's set in the type code field down here. Ah, looks like it's missing a type because it goes one, two, three, and four, but, and five, but it doesn't list four. I wonder what four is. If the extended length bit of the attribute flags octet is set to zero, the third octet of the path attribute contains the length of the attribute data in octets. If the length extended length bit of the attribute flags octet is set to one, the third and fourth octets of the path attribute contain the length of the attribute data in octets. The remaining octets of the path attribute represent the attribute value and are interpreted according to the attribute flags and the attributes type code. The supported attribute type codes and their attribute values are as follows. Okay, so we're going to learn what code 4 is. Um, 
So here's the type code. The next are the uh, value. We've got a length and then we've got a value. The first value um, is origin, which we see right here. I'll collapse the unnecessary ones. Okay, now okay. Yeah, that's the most collapsed I can make it. Okay, oh, I can collapse. Okay, there we go. Well, I can collapse that as well. So here's the first one, origin. Origin is a well-known mandatory attribute that defines the origin of the path information. The data octet can assume the following values. Here we have a value of zero, and we can see that if I uh, click, there we go, we can see it's a, a zero there. So the meaning of a zero is IGP, network layer reachability information is interior to the originating AS. You can also have a value of one, with a meaning of EGP, network layer reachability information learned via the EGP protocol. So I can do that in the lab. All I've got to do is uh, reform these uh, this neighborship, but do it across autonomous systems. So I'm going to do that. So we'll do local AS on this uh, uh, 600. We'll also do a set type external. And then we'll do a local AS. And we can commit that. We'll get a notification message. All sorts of issues. But we'll, um, oops, actually, we can't commit that yet. Oh, um, it's not the local AS I, I meant to configure. I meant to configure the. Remote AS. Okay, okay. and I'll set I'll set a custom local AS as well. That'll be six hundred. So then we'll see the path attributes. Uh, field for AS path uh, populate a, a bit more densely as well. Oh, okay, there we go. So, I think the other side is that one. Uh, let me try that. One, I should see ISMP. Oh no, it looks like it's top two. I don't see any ISMP. Cross the link. Oh, oh, but I'm, I'm filtering for BGP, so I'm not going to see it. Okay, so is it... Okay, it is that one. Okay, so set neighbor 10 dot... Oh, I can also do a show pipe. So they set relative. There we go, yeah, set neighbor. And then uh, remote AS 400. Or actually, pure AS. Yes. Okay. 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 Okay, and then we'll set this side. Oops. Oh, okay. Well, let's do. Oh, I forgot to set this. Okay. There we go. So now we're going to, yep, we've got four-way disconnect, notification, hard reset, but uh, we're not going to have it. Um, we're not going to have it uh, work now. So let's see. Uh, we'll call this GP. So now we'll um, get a three-way handshake, sin, sinac, ek. Yep. 
Yep, yeah, and we've got our open messages. So now if I, and then we got our update messages. So now if I go back, this is exactly what we were looking at before. We're going to see a bit is now flipped in the, um, the origin field here. Um, now we've got um, the, oh, why is it not flipped? It should be, it should be flipped. Like I was expecting this uh, here, this origin value to be a one instead of a zero. Yeah, we can see it traversed a AS path, so. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong route. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, well, I don't know. So, network layer reachability, information learned via the EGP protocol. And, and if it were zero, it would say network layer reachability information is interior to the originating. Oh, I see. Okay, so no, this is right, because this, um, um, route here, and we'll see the route it's talking about in the NLRI down here, oh, I'm talking about two routes, both of them are internal to the AS where this was learned from. Um, in this case, it was learned from AS 600. So it is going to be uh, uh, IGP origin, because it's basically the origin of the origin. Like, it, it originated in AS 600. But within AS600, it originated within AS600. You would see a value of 1 if it originated outside of AS600. So, for example, if it was forwarding on a route it learned from another AS, then you would see EGP. So I can do that. Um, I can set up another... Uh, neighborship um, over here on router one and now I can send a, 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 a route over um, to router six from router one by forming a neighborship between router one and router four and um, then uh, I can flip the bit by doing that assuming there's not, because this, I, I'm surprised. I need to, let me check something quick. Uh, I'll be back. All right, I'm back. I needed to take an extended break there. Um, I don't particularly remember um, where I left off. Um, so let me pull up the RFC again. I, I closed it. Okay, and then hopefully it'll, yeah, okay, I remember. I was learning about um, update, um, the update message format. So yeah, I was, I was learning about the uh, path attributes. Oh, actually, no, this is, this is it. I was learning about the origin uh, well-known uh, mandatory attribute. And I was trying to get uh, the bit flipped uh, here um, from 0 to 1. So one of the ways I tried to do that was 
by setting up an eBGP connection instead of an IBGP connection between uh, two routers. So before, uh, router 6 and router 4 were in the same autonomous system. And I thought that just by putting them in different autonomous systems, I could flip this bit here and have the origin be EGP instead of IGP. But that was a misunderstanding of what those bits mean. What it means for a for network layer re, layer reachability information to be interior to the originating AS is exactly that. The route I was passing, even though I'm passing it across ASs, it belonged to this AS uh, here. It belonged to the loopback address on a device in that AS. Therefore, it originated uh, within the AS and it's IGP even though it traverses an AS. So the only way to make it EGP is to pass on a route that did not originate in the same autonomous system. So I think a good uh, yeah, so of course one way I can do that is just by setting up another neighborship from router one um, and having this be another eBGP connection. And now the AS path will, be, will have three ASs that it'll tra tra traverse through. And then, of course, from um, router four, it's going to learn it. I wonder if it's still going to be. Um, I wonder if it would still be IGP then, though, because it would originate in. Uh, Well, anyway, let, let, let's live and learn um, and uh, try to figure this out. So, obviously, this is a, a point where I'm, I'm a bit shaky or, or confused about it. And this is exactly what I'm uh, trying to, uh, to overcome here. So, and conveniently, just in time for my retake, if I choose to do that. But I've, I've discussed that a few times, and I'm starting to kind of get to the conclusion that uh, I'd be much better off uh, doing books and, and just making sure that my real world professional experience over the next um, however many years, probably about three years, because if I don't pass this cert, I'll need to do research next year, I'll need to research my CCMP and I'll need to research my J and CIP. Um, so, I mean, it'd be nice if I could um, avoid having to research that JNCIP um, just by passing the JNCIE. Um, that would be really, really, really nice. Um, but uh, as I discussed before, I'm just not sure if having a CCIE, or sorry, a JNCIE at this point in my career with about five years of professional experience is like appropriate. It, I'm just not sure that it's a um, level that I'm actually at in, in the real world. Like, because there's a difference between how well you do in a test and, and uh, what you actually can do in the real world. And if, if you're, um, and if those are misaligned, um, that could be, in my opinion, uh, uh, that could lead to to professional real world experiences that aren't as enriching as ones where you show up at the job and and you 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 show up with the skill set that you're expected to have. Um, if I were to get the JNCIESP, I might be expected to have a a, a skill set that really is a bit beyond me, even though I was able to uh, demonstrate competency in it in the isolated environment of an exam. So I'm still kind of struggling with 
uh, a decision of whether or not to retake it. Um, I do have that discount if I retake it before August, but the JNCIE expert, any expert level exam is, is just going to be uh, a next step up, a really big uh, achievement, and I'm just not sure if uh, that kind of achievement is warranted at this stage in my career. Um, I might be better off focusing more on real-world practical skills, like reading some uh, books on uh, DevOps and, and, and uh, uh, like automatically mapping out uh, network topologies and like really getting those kind of skills uh, much, much better um, and uh, being, being able to outperform uh, on the job. Like, like being able to outperform on the job, I think, uh, is, is, it's more likely if you're um, reading a lot of books and doing a lot of exercises than if you just have a cert. And in fact, if a cert like the IE, your performance might be expected to be uh, at a higher level than, than it actually is. something I've talked about. I, I might even just do that, actually. Um, after this video, I might just make another video just to start the series where I read the DevOps book, because I had a, a series before where I read a book, um, and I've always been wanting to just have a series where I read a book, and that's all I do. I don't uh, study for an exam. I don't do anything but read a, a Kindle book and take notes and, and go through the exercises and all that. Um, and uh, I did that with a, a book on Kindle that just turned out not to be a, a book I would recommend. It didn't have terrible contents. Uh, it had, I think it had a number of typos in it. It was just not a book I would, I would recommend. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so next step is going to be setting up uh, PGP. So for the autonomous system, we'll, we'll say uh, 10,000. Okay. okay, and then this connects to 400. set up uh, IP addresses as well. Okay, so this is going to be, I think, five to four? Yeah, five to four. Okay, and I'll need to set up another uh, BGP neighbor on that other side as well. But I'm pretty sure I've got everything ready to go on, on this side. Um, oops, I, I didn't have the, I don't have the neighbor statement. So let me make sure that the IP is correct. 
like I configured that correctly. It looks like it didn't configure it correctly somehow. Um, I thought I did. Oh, I configured it on the wrong router. It has to be on router six. Oh, sorry, it has to be router four, not router six. So the PRAS is going to be, I think it was 400, I don't remember. Okay, so we'll have it be 1. I'm going to change the local on this to 2. why it was behaving unexpectedly? I don't think so, though. So we're at 2098. Okay, so we are still capturing packets. Um, but we've just got and this is the update we were looking at before, I think. But we still got in, in that, uh, yeah, we don't have any new updates, and we still got the bit set to zero. Okay, so it's time to set up the neighborship. Pure AS is going to be AS1. Okay, and then um, type external. Okay, and then we're going to set up a address on the loopback. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna make it a little bit cleaner um, what shows up in, in which address table, too. Um, so on router 2 and router 6, I have a policy where it's named advertise, where I uh, advertise everything that, that's protocol direct. So I'm going to clean that up um, so that I'm not uh, advertising all protocol direct routes. route filter, and then we're only going to advertise the loopback zero address. And we'll, we'll, we'll change it to 4.4.4.4. Four 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 four. So Oops, I think I messed that up, actually. And then I'm going to change the family inet address 
jump it on loop back zero, just so it's a little bit more clear. You would never do this in the real world, only in the lab, because the 4.4.4.4 address space is public space that belongs to a company. But in the lab, it's not connected to the outside world at all, so that's no big, no big deal. Uh, and it makes it more clear what's going on. Okay, so I'm going to... I won't be able to copy the whole thing. In fact, I won't be able to copy hardly anything. I'm starting to get a little bit tired. And it's it's 8.30, I need to do something quick. Uh, okay, but I'm, I'm almost done with this. something that's a bit more clear for the time being. We're getting rid of just every protocol and then we're adding a, um, hmm. what happened to, oh, I forgot the keyword exact. So now that I have a valid next hop advertising, uh, we won't see any hidden routes anymore. So if I do a show route protocol BGP, I don't need to add the hidden keyword. In fact, if I do that, now we don't have anything in there at all. And uh, now it's a little bit more uh, clear. Um, well, actually, it looks like we're still getting I think we're getting these extra routes just because they haven't tied out of the table yet. So let's let's try severing that or bouncing that neighborship. So now it dropped out. Um, oh, but both of them are bad. Um, let's weird. Oh, one looks cool. Oh. After turn two, I think I think I did this wrong. I think term one needs a then statement, or at least that's one way to do it. This is a, this is part of uh, what I need uh, to do better on.
Yeah, I thought I had a, a much better grasp on this sort of thing than I actually do. There we go. At least now they're in the right order. Let's see what it looks like on this one. Okay, it's on the right order on this one. Okay, but let's see if I think I need like a Oh, this is interesting. So this is the Oh, there's a slash twenty four. Oh, okay, I meant to make this slash thirty. Let's let's clean that up. Um I, I've got an addressing overlap because I made this a slash 24 and then I made this link a slash 30 so that's not going to work let's clean that up Looks like I have. Oh, oh I, yeah. yeah, I should have two addresses. That's the thing with Junipers is they let you make addressing mistakes. Uh, Cisco, you'll get a message saying that it overlaps, but on uh, Juniper, they let you do that. Maybe that will fix the issue. I think I'm going to need to more than just Oops. Yeah, I need to do more than that. took some time for it to come back. I've still got these extra routes though. I don't know how these are making it in there. Because on, so let's see, the show route, receive protocol, PGP. So yeah, I'm receiving these routes, but my export policy Doesn't appear to be a clue. Oh, I see. So, yeah, so the way the matching goes is it'll go through these terms and find the most specific term. If it doesn't match, uh, it will go to the next term. So, this needs to be a then. Uh, reject or, or then a reject and so then accept. Okay. Either that or, yeah, I think that's the problem. Actually, it needs to be a then except here. Yeah, and then the term two is the then reject. Okay, I think that's how it's meant to be. I'm not sure. Okay, 
Yeah, yeah so that's how it's meant to be. Yeah, yeah and, and to prove it, I'll, I'll take that reject statement out. Um, oops, I'll do a refresh one on this, so this will keep going. And then if I take that reject statement out, uh, those routes will come back. I guess it, it's just needed to be in the same term. Um, yeah, I don't know what's going on there. That is not acting the way I expected it to act. What if I take... What if I take this statement out? Well... Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm honestly... A little bit lost right now. And I'm, I'm at a, at a studio. I think it's because I had that second term without a from statement on it, so it just accepted everything for the second term. I think it's better now. Yeah, okay, it's, it's good now. All right, so let's try to flip that bit. We're gonna get a, an update message like the one we have here. But it's going to not be for withdrawn routes. It's going to be for new routes. Um, so it's going to contain uh, path attributes as well as NLRI. But we'll see the first path attribute, the origin attribute, as EBGP, EGP, or a bit value of 1 flipped to on instead of IGP. Is it not doing what I'm expecting it to do? So it's not forming a neighborship. That's what I'm expecting it to do. So type external neighbor curious. Oh, I don't have the other side set up. Can use the same group. I'm just gonna use the same group.
still not forming. Okay, so we've got... Uh, this is correct. Uh, I think that's correct. I think it's got to form it to Autonomous System 1. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Why is it not working? Maybe it just needs some time. Oh, I see why. Because I set my local AS within the group. So it can't form it to this local AS because it's it's to to this local AS or AS one because it's it's got a new one specific to this group. So I gotta change it to four hundred on this side. So now, um, I might need a policy though, and I might need an additional policy, but let's, let's add um, the first policy. I got it. So now we've got a uh, route here, um, but we can still we can see it's still I. So obviously I'm not understanding this very well, um, and I think that makes sense because we've got a. Oh, sorry, no, it's it's this is the one we'll be looking at. So I was looking at the wrong. No, I'm looking at the right one here. Okay, okay yeah, so it's still... And I, and I think that makes sense because this did originate um, within that AS. So...
but I think if we were to pass it on um, a different way on router four, we can get that to to flip. to change this origin code. Okay, okay. there's a third one as well, incomplete number of reachability information learned by some other means. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.1. Um, so the next one is the AS path. Before I move on, I think I will um, I will get try to get this to work. You know what? I think I think it's a little bit different. Um, I think it's a bit different than what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that it will flip to EGP if it's learned. Oh, I think I'm I'm I I just. Conceptually, I don't have the right idea. Um, I'm thinking that you can flip it, the bit, um, by certain means that actually are not uh, available in the way I thought them to be. I mean, it's probably all right there in the in the RFC. All of this is just probably RFC information. Like anything I find through a Google search on like vskills.in is probably, assuming it's not garbage, just coming from the RFCs anyway. But I mean, this is kind of what I was looking for, though. The exterior gateway protocol EGP is now is a now obsolete routing protocol for the internet, originally specified in 1982 by Eric C. Rosen. So yeah, this is this is what this is where my misconception was. So I was thinking that you would have that uh, bit zero or one be set based on how a route was brought into BGP. If it was brought into BGP through a, a, a means specific or, or, or where, where the route was initially brought into to BGP. So I, I used to think, and, and I don't believe this anymore, I, I understand it now, um, but where my misunderstanding was is the origination of a route. So I thought this I meant that the route existed somewhere in the autonomous system. Uh, for example, uh, this is autonomous system 10,000, so I thought that would mean that the route was a, a uh, loopback address, a, a, a port address, a, a statically configured route, uh, you know, something, even if it was learned through OSPF, 
it would still exist in that autonomous system, and uh, that's why it got the distinction of IGP. Alternately, if it were learned outside of the autonomous system um, through like BGP, and then you wanted to pass it to another BGP um, autonomous system without including the uh, initial path it came through or any information about it, it originating uh, outside uh, any specific information about its uh, outside origination, you would just have a path begin with E and have that bit be one and then that would just say this came from somewhere else but I'm not going to tell you where it came from. Not how it works at all. Um, basically it's just saying that you either learned it from an interior gateway protocol or an exterior gateway protocol, or sorry, not an exterior period gateway protocol. So, so to be clear, it's saying that either you learned it through an interior gateway protocol, then it would be set to zero, or you learned it through the exterior gateway protocol named EGP, as was specified in RFC 904, which is historic RFC, doesn't exist, it's not set up anywhere. So basically, you're never, ever, ever going to see this um, be an E. It's always going to be an I. It's always going to be set to zero because it's just a relic of history. There's no need anymore to say that it was learned from the EGP protocol because that protocol is no longer widely implemented. So it's just it's just a relic of history. It's going to be set to, to zero. And um, it's just basically the beginning of, a, of an IS path. It's going to be an I uh, every time, unless you're passing traffic using the historic RFC 904, uh, originally published in 1984 for some reason, which you're not going to be. So, okay, I got, I got confused. I was actually, um, I was actually overcomplicating it right quite a bit. I thought it was actually a pretty complicated uh, thing to understand is when this is going to be set to IGP, when it's going to be learned to uh, EGP, and then when it's going to be complete. But this is actually a really simple uh, code, this origin code. It's just going to be zero pretty much all the time, unless it's learned from historic RFC 904 exterior gateway protocol <laughs> and I, I basically don't think that will ever happen in a modern network yeah that'll never happen in a modern network Yeah, and that's and that's because EGP was replaced by BGP version four. So if you're running BGP, you're already not running EGP. They're they're different things. Okay, so it's always good to know that uh, it's actually easier than I thought it was. I was overcomplicating it and, and setting myself up uh, to failure unnecessarily, so I can save myself some mental space on that. Okay, so I'm going to try to get um, down to the network layer reachability section. So the next path attributes, so in order to do that, I've got to get through all the path attributes first. It's going to be the AS path, and I do need to take a quick break. I'll be back, and, and uh, I'll be back shortly. Okay, I'm back. Um, let's try to get through this section of the this mammoth RFC. It's, it's a big one, but we can get down to um, network, flitch, re network layer reachability information. That will be a pretty darn good accomplishment for today. Okay, so next is AS path. So let's take a look at that. Um, the most recent updates I should have gotten a few updates well let's get a withdraw okay so 
we'll get a, an update message with a, with some withdrawn routes here, well, with a single withdrawn route. So here's the update message, and here's the withdrawn route. So let's get full back and get some path attributes. Okay, so here's our update message for getting the route back, and here's our path attributes. So the next path to the view we're going to learn about is the AS path. AS path is a well-known mandatory attribute that is composed of a sequence of AS path segments. Each AS path segment is represented by a triple path segment type, path segment length, path segment value, TLV, type length value. So let's look at that. Path segment type, length, and then they don't say value, but this is the, the value. I kind of wish they would say value so that you can recognize it more as a, as a triple, but whatever. The path segment type is a one octet length field with the following values defined value one as underscore set uh so it's path segments type yeah here we go uh oh sorry now it would be it would be type length value so here's the um here's the uh codes that tell you what kind of uh attributes it has. This is a well-known uh, transitive and it's um, the type is the AS path. So here's the type length value, but within within this as well, there's also type length value, type length, and then the values down here. So the segment type is a one octet. We can see that here. I'm going to switch this to binary. Um, sometimes I find that's a little bit easier to um, to comprehend. There you go, that's bits. So now we're seeing the actual bits. So if I say it's a 8-bit uh, uh, thing, you see 8 characters uh, down there. I, I like that a lot better. It's a little bit more of an Eiffel... Um, takes up more of your screen space, but makes things uh, a little bit easier to understand, I think. So here we can see we've got AS sequence, the second one, but the, so we've got a value of two, but a value of one is the AS set, unordered set of ASs, a route in the update message has traversed. So that's unordered. Value two, what we have here, is AS sequence, and that's an ordered set of ASs a route in the update message has traversed. The path length segment is a one octet length field containing the number of ASs, not the number of octets, in the path segment value field. The path segment value field contains one or more AS numbers, each encoded as a two octet length field. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.2. I wish they explained these a little bit better. Like, like when is it, when would you get an unordered one? When would it be ordered? Is it always ordered? Is it sometimes unordered? That is unclear to me. I think, I think I think they're going to do that later on. That's why this is such a long RFC, because in section 5.1.2, we'll come back to these and, and we'll get those kinds of answers um, the, about the usage of the attribute. So that will be uh, really eye-opening, I think. But until then, we're going to move on to the next AS path attribute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. To the next path attribute. We learned about the AS path path attribute. Now we're going to learn about the next hop 
path attribute. So I will shrink the AS path attribute here in Wireshark and keep this uh, final attribute, next hop attribute, expanded. This is attribute number three. Next hop, type code three. This is a well-known mandatory attribute that defines the unicast IP address of the router that should be used as the next hop to the destinations listed in the network layer reachability information field of the update message. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.3. Okay, now here's a big one. I remember in a lot of the exams I took, um, a lot of the study I did, uh, again, not speaking to what is on the exam, but uh, a lot of a lot of the training I did really had this uh, as an emphasis, this multi-exit discriminator uh, type code for path attribute as something that was uh, really uh, emphasized. Um, and unfortunately, I do feel a little bit uh, uh, uncomfortable with with this concept. I kind of memorize, have it memorized as, as as a fact, and not really as a. It's like a vocab word word for me, if that makes sense. If I'm learning a new language, this is a piece of vocabulary, and, and this is this is like a. You know, just a, a, a random vocabulary word I know. It's not a, a word I use every day and really understand the meaning of very well. This is an optional, non-transitive attribute. So that's quite a bit different. It's, it's not a well-known mandatory attribute. It's a optional, non-transitive attribute. A, a well-known uh, attribute is transitive. So if we were to see the multi-exit discriminator pop up, we would see uh, a one here, and then we would see uh, a zero here, because it's optional and it's non-transitive. This is an optional non-transitive attribute that is a four octet unsigned integer. The value of this attribute may be used by a speaker's decision process to discriminate among multiple entry points to a neighboring autonomous system. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.4. And that's nice because it aligns with the, the code number. So this is the missing code. We only see uh, codes 1, 2, and 3. Um, and uh, before we saw the fourth, we saw the, the fifth code, local preference, but we did not see, um, I'm surprised twice. I guess I don't understand why local preference is not, uh, is not showing here. Yeah, that's interesting. Where's local preference? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, moving on, local preference. Local preference is a well-known attribute that is a four octet unsigned integer. A BGP speaker uses it to inform its other internal peers of the advertising speaker's degree of preference for an advertised route. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.5. Atomic aggregate type code Six atomic aggregate is a well-known discretionary attribute of length zero. Use of this aggregate is defined in this attribute is defined in 5.1.6 for type code six. Type code seven is the aggregator. Aggregator is an optional transitive attribute of length six. The attribute contains the last AS number that formed the aggregate route encoded as two octets followed by the IP address of the BGP speaker that formed the aggregate route encoded as four octets. This should be the same address as the one used for the BGP identifier of the speaker. Usage of this attribute is defined in 5.1.7 as this is type code seven. 
So, okay, we made it down to um, network layer reachability information. Um, it would have been nice to, to make it beyond that. I guess I can try to, well, no, I'm pretty tired. And I'm hitting the two hour mark soon. Well, let me just, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna give it a try. Network layer reachability information. This variable length field, um, as we can see here, and I can shrink the path attributes, we're done learning about that, contains a list of IP address prefixes, as we can see here. The length in octets of the network layer reachability information is not encoded explicitly, but can be calculated as update message length. 23 total attributes length withdrawn routes length so here we've got a okay so so it's not going to be so so the length of this so one 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 thing that's different um, in this field than uh, other fields is if I expand the path attributes field I've got the length if I look at the uh, border gateway uh, after the marker we've got the length this is something that uh, shows up quite a bit um, is, is this uh, idea of, of here we go we have the TCP segment lengths we have a field that tells us how long the message is. That, that is a very common thing. Um, that is not a part of network layer reachability information. But that's because it exists as the... Um, it's, it's implied because it, it equals the update message length. In, in this case, it is... Um, 52, there's this is 23. Um, the total path attributes length. Oh, sorry, no, this, so this is a mathematical uh, equation. It, it just, it looks a little bit weird because they're missing a part. Um, I wish they had, they had written it this way and this will, this will hopefully make it a lot clearer. So here's what they have, but here's how it would be more clear. Equals. So the length of the network layer reachability information is equal to the update message length. So let's take a look at what that was. So 52 minus 23 minus the total path attributes length, which is 24. minus the withdrawn routes length. So let's take a look at what that value is. It should be zero. It's zero. Okay, and I might might be embarrassing time because I might need to bring out the calculator for this. I am uh, born in USA after all, but uh, I, I can probably, so yeah, so it would be, it'd be 29 um, minus 24, I, I believe. So, so we get a value of, of uh, five. Okay. Oh, and is this five bytes? Because if it's five bytes, I was right. By 
but I don't think it's five bytes. I think it's bits. Yeah, yeah it's talking, talking about bits. bits. Oh. Okay, yeah, because the length of, of this message is, is 52. Oh, you know what? It could be, it could be bytes. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure what this length 52 means. Does it mean uh, how many bytes there are? Oh, no. Here it says length in bits. Okay, so, yeah, this, this I'm, I'm getting confused by. Um, ah, okay. I was right. So, network layer reachability information. This variable length field contains a list of IP address prefixes. The length in octets. So, I was right with five, and we can see here are the five uh, octets. Oh, oops. I wish you could hover over without selecting because because I, I, I'd rather just select it up here and not, I mean I guess it's it's good to be able to see like oh this is the checksum oh this is the time to live value I assume this is the TCP I guess it's good to see it um, go in and select things like that when you go down here but um, I wish I could like freeze it or like or like toggle modes between like just not have it automatically do that or like only only do it when I click and I don't know but uh, I was right with my calculation uh, there are five octets I just didn't know that it was measured in octets okay so I'll keep reading this um, yep, so this is very unclear here. Um, more clear is if you include uh, both sides of the equation and uh, you, you state that the length of network layer reachability information is equal to the update message length minus 23 octets. So, so the update message length in octets 23 octets, which account for fixed control traffic, minus total path attributes length in octets, minus withdrawn routes length in octets. So total path attributes length, uh, we've got uh, 24 uh, octets. So if I were to click this, yes. We can see that looks like it's about, yep, and an octet is a byte, so it is measured in bytes, and we can see down here, 24 bytes, so it'll count it up for us, down here, 5 bytes, perfect. Where update message length is the value encoded in the fixed size BGP header, total path attribute length and withdrawn routes length are the values encoded in the variable part of the update message. And 23 is a combined length of the fixed size BGP header, the total path attribute length field, 
and the withdrawn routes length field. Reachability information is encoded as one or more two tuples of the form length prefix whose fields are described below. Length is uh, octets, in octets, one octet. Prefix is a variable. The use and the meaning of these fields are as follows. Length, the length field indicates the length in bits of the IP address prefix. A length of zero indicates a prefix that matches all IP addresses with prefix itself of zero octets. Prefix, the prefix field contains an IP address prefix followed by enough trailing bits to make the end of the field fall on an octet boundary. So let's see if it had to do it in this case. Note that the value of the trailing bits is irrelevant. So nope, it didn't have to fall uh, on an, an octet uh, boundary. Um, uh, if we had uh, hmm. I guess I can't really think of a situation where where you would need that. I guess if you were using uh, multi-protocol BGP and uh, doing um, uh, IPv6 and IPv4 addresses, you'd have 128 bits. Um, so you'd, you'd have 160 bits. Um, and, uh, but even that, I think, would be on a, a boundary, but anyways, um, if it ever happens so that it doesn't complete on a boundary, it will be padded until it does. The minimum length of the update message is 23 octets. 19 octets for the fixed header, plus two octets for the withdrawn routes, plus two octets for the total attribute length. The value of withdrawn routes length is zero, and the value of the total path attribute length is zero. So this, this number 23 here, um, that's because of those uh, fixed uh, fields. So these, these are all variable fields here, the uh, message length, uh, the, the total path attributes uh, length, the actual value, and then the withdrawn uh, attributes length. So, so you can think of it like this. You've got to subtract the length of the update message as well as the length of the field that tells you the length of the update message. So the length of that field is part of this 23. Additionally, not only do you need to subtract the total path attributes length, so clicking here, you can see these 24 bytes that are highlighted need to be subtracted, a value of 24. You also need to subtract the length of the field that tells you the total path attribute length. This field here, which we can see is two bytes. So that added together with the update uh, message length field here, so two plus um, two equals four. But in addition to that, You've got um, uh, you've got the header, which which includes the marker. So four plus sixteen is twenty is twenty, and the type, which is one, which equals twenty three. So that that number twenty three is the uh, header of your BGP protocol message, and the header consists of the marker, the length field, and the type field. The marker field is 16, so that's 16 plus the length field, which is 2, which is 18. 
plus the type field, which is 1, which is 19. And it also consists of the total path attribute length field, the length of that field, which is 2. So we've got 21. And then the uh, uh, what was the other one? Oh, the see this this is where it gets tricky. This field here, even though it has a value of zero, still exists as a field. So you got to add two um, to the 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 value that you subtract from this total message, this, this 52 message, to get the length of, of this part of the message. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, it, it definitely makes sense to me now. I, I was having a really hard time understanding that until I kind of broke it down and went a little bit more slowly. The minimum length, yeah, so I already read that. Um, Yeah, so let me read that one more time. The minimum length of the update message is 23 octets, 19 octets for the fixed header, which includes the three three uh, portions, the marker, the length, and the type. So 16, 2, and 2. Sorry, 16, 2, and 1. Two octets for the withdrawn route length right here. We can see that is 2 plus two octets for the total path attribute length. We can see that's right here, that is two as well. The value of withdrawn routes length is zero, and the value of the total path attribute length is zero. Huh, okay, well that's interesting that they say that because I don't know if they're talking about like a I don't know what they mean by that because we can see the value of of these are are not those values, but but that's still I don't know this this is confusing. I kind of wish they hadn't included this because I was understanding it more. Um, I think they're just trying to make the point um, that even if the value of these are zero, you would still consider the length of the length field <laughs> and, and that might be uh, confusing to some people is you might think oh well the length field is zero so therefore I don't need to include these two bytes it's like well the length field is two bytes long the value of zero is the next part of the message how long is that it's zero so therefore, the message is at least two bytes. It's not zero bytes because the length field has a length. An update message can advertise at most one set of path attributes, but multiple destinations, provided that the destinations share these attributes. All path attributes contained in a given update message apply to all destinations carried in the NLRI field of the update message. An update message can list multiple routes that are to be withdrawn from service. Each such route is identified by its destination expressed as an IP prefix, which unambiguously identifies the route in the context of the BGP speaker, BGP speaker connection to which it has been previously advertised. An update message might advertise only routes that are to be withdrawn from service, in which case the message will not include path attributes or network layer reachability information. Conversely, it may advertise only a feasible route, in which case the withdrawn routes field need not, need not be present as they... Oh! Oh, okay. Okay, that's if it's advertising a feasible route, which I don't think we're seeing here. An update message should not include the same address prefix in the withdrawn routes and the network layer, layer reachability information fields. Yeah, that, that sounds like a, a loop almost here. 
However, a BGP speaker must be able to process update messages in this form. A BGP speaker should treat an update message in this form as though the withdrawn routes do not contain the address prefix. Okay, so I made it. I barely made it, but it was only an extra 15 minutes, and now uh, it's easier to tell where, my, uh, where I left off in my sections. So uh, that's going to be it for this uh, episode of Wild Networking, where I focus on network engineering as it is seen in the wild and not um, on an exam. A uh, really good way to do that is to focus on uh, RFCs because that's a primary source. And um, if you're on the job, you're always going to be able to pull up an RFC as long as you have a, an internet connection. So. Um, that's what I did in this video, and I'll see you in the next one.